Same approach in terms of sampling. You have to plan your sample. You then perform your sample and evaluate the results. So similar to when we talked about um, attribute sampling, same approach. Documentation, right? We have to document our samples. So we're in, we need to know what the objective of the audit is. What is our objective in this audit test? Um, and in this case, with variable sampling is we want to determine that the account is fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, what's our characteristic of interest? Uh, what are we auditing? What is the recorded value? So instance in which the audited value differs from the recorded value, right? That's the misstatement. So we have to define what is a misstatement and let's say for accounts receivable. What would be a misstatement for accounts receivable? What, first of all, what audit procedure would you perform and what would be the misstatement after performing that? Right, so you, it'll be, you're looking at account balances, so that's the, the, the category, right, that you're looking at. But what's the, what audit procedure, what audit test would you perform? You're testing existence, what do we normally test? What's a procedure associated with existence for accounts receivable? No, that's another assertion related to transactions. But the audit procedure, the actual audit test. Right. You confirm accounts receivable. So that's your audit test. So if you define, um, if your uh, objective is to determine that accounts receivable exist and that it is, the amount recorded is fairly stated in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, right, gap. And you now want, to, and your characteristic of interest is you're trying to determine if there are any misstatements. You perform the audit test. The audit test is to confirm accounts receivable, right? And what would ca classify a difference? If accounts receivable is recorded at 10,000 and you got a confirmation back that said 5,000, that's, that's, that's a difference, right? So you're looking, your test is trying to determine that accounts receivable exists and the value at which it exists. That's one test anyway, right? So if there's a difference from the recorded value, you're going to note that in your test of accounts receivable, right? You're going to note that the book value says 10,000 for this receivable and the customer confirmed back that it's 5,000, right? So that's gonna be considered an exception. Um, define what the population is, completeness is important. So in staying with the accounts receivable, um, you're going to look at the accounts receivable trial balance and you're going to perform tests to ensure that the accounts receivable trial balance is complete. So in testing uh, the relationship, think about the relationship between transactions and the balance, uh, balance sheet accounts uh, resulting from those sales transactions in this case with accounts receivable, right? So you've performed tests, so you know something about accounts receivable trans transactions that have impacted accounts receivable because you've audited sales, you've audited revenue, right? So you want, you, you're gonna also see that there, there's a reconciliation process, that the client on a, a monthly basis reconciles the, the accounts receivable subledger or trial balance to the general ledger. So you're going to perform tests to ensure the completeness. And then you decide whether you're going to use monetary unit sampling, uh, which is looking at sampling from the dollars uh, comprising that account balance, or variable sampler, sampling, which looks at individual components or transactions from uh, comprising that account balance. So once you define your population, now you select your sample and you perform your audit procedures. Um, same thing, you have to determine what your initial sample size is. Remember what our criteria be sampling risk, the risk of incorrect acceptance, uh, your expected misstatement, your tolerable misstatement, which you determined when you did your material, when you determined materiality, planning materiality, and then select the population size um, recorded account balance. Select the sample and measure. 
Um, and in our case, the substantive procedure that we were performing with the accounts receivable is to confirm accounts receivable. Um, then if we don't get all the confirmations back, what do we do? Do we consider that a, a difference? Why or why not? If a customer does not return a confirmation, is that a misstatement or a difference? Why or why not? Omar. No, let's, uh, you're, I think you're jumping ahead a little bit. So let's, back. so let's just talk about, now we're performing the audit procedure. The audit procedure is we confirmed accounts received. We sent out hundreds of confirmations to client, customers. We got back 90% of those. So let's say we sent out 100, we got back 90. There are 10 that we didn't get back. Is that considered a difference? Because we didn't get it back, does that mean that there's a difference in the recorded value? Why? That's right, it's not. Why is it not? You don't know, all you know is you didn't get a confirmation back. Vivian. Isn't it because uh, it's not guaranteed that the customer will send a Right, we, the customer is under no obligation to send us a confirmation. That just makes our job a little bit easier, right, as auditors. That if the, if the customer, if we send out a confirmation and the customer returns the confirmation with no differences, we could check the box and say, okay, the, this accounts receivable exists, right? If the customer doesn't send it back to us, that doesn't mean that it's an exception. It doesn't mean that the customer doesn't agree with the amount. So then what do we do? When the customer doesn't send it back to us, what do we do? Is our, is our testing complete at that point? What do we do? Right. So we do additional audit proceedings. Because we're still auditing accounts receivable. Right? So you can't, so my point is you can't just, if your test is looking at, conf, you know, sending out confirmations, okay, and if you don't get all the confirmations back, that doesn't mean it's an exception. Right? You now have to perform alternative procedures, remember? Alternative procedures, and in this case, alternative procedures when we don't receive a cash, I'm sorry, when we don't receive a confirmation back, is that we look at subsequent cash receipts or we look at shipping documents and customer uh, invoices, those types of things, right? So we perform uh, alternate procedures on that sample in that case, and then we look at, after performing all of our audit procedures on that account, then we're going to evaluate, you know? We perform the appropriate substantive procedures. Now we calculate the actual misstatement. So we look at any differences that the customer identified in the confirmation against what the client has recorded for that customer in the uh, accounts receivable trial balance or subledger. We look at, if we didn't get a confirmation back, we try to look at subsequent cash receipts. And if we see that there are subsequent cash receipts, um, then there's no exception. If we can find evidence to support that, or if the evidence that we do find differs from what is recorded, then that's considered a, a, a misstatement. So, and notice the term, it's not an exception, it's a misstatement, right? Because we're talking about account balances. Now we do have to determine if it's a material misstatement, but it's a misstatement at this point. Look at the audited value, which is the information that the auditor has gathered from the audit procedures that they perform versus the client's recorded value, right, to analyze the misstatement, the amount of misstatement. In evaluating our results, so the last part is now we performed our audit procedures, so now let's, we've come up, we've uh, identified where the recorded value differs from the audited value. Um, then we look at evaluating what's the problem with the actual misstatement, um, right? And we have to determine, do we have a representative sample, right? So this is where the auditor's judgment comes in. Do we have, first of all, if you planned your sample correctly, you should have a representative sample. Uh, you might need to adjust your actual, uh, I'm sorry, you need to adjust your actual misstatement to control for the risk of incorrect acceptance, right? So you want to make sure, because here's your risk with incorrect acceptance. That means that you've accepted um, 
of the results um, and they really don't apply, right? They, that you're going to incorrectly accept so that you've increased the risk of misstatement if you have not planned correctly and evaluated your results correctly. And similar to when we talked about the attribute sampling, you have to calculate an upper limit on your misstatements, your upper limit on misstatements, and compare that upper limit on your misstatements to your tolerable misstatement that you calculated in your planning when you calculated planning materiality. So that, because ultimately what you're trying to do is evaluate whether or not the account contains a material misstatement. What happens if it contains a material misstatement? What, is that, what do you do? Do you qualify the audit opinion? Why or why not? When, let's start with, why would, when wouldn't you qualify the audit opinion if you found a material misstatement? When would you not qualify? Not the, the client. Well, you don't have to leave the client, but okay, but you're on the right track, right? So if, if you find a misstatement, then you propose an adjustment to the client. Right? You give more than a day. But they have to do it before you sign off on the audited statements, right? So you give the client, you say, here are our pr the proposed adjustments. And the client, if it's a material misstatement, the client should book it. It's as simple as that. If it's a material misstatement, you can't give them a pass and say, okay. Right? Because basically your opinion is that the financial statements are fairly stated. They're in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So you would require the client to make an adjustment. And if the client makes the adjustment, then the books are no longer materially misstated or the account is no longer materially misstated. However, if the client refuses to make the adjustment, then you can't possibly sign off on that audit, right? Because the account contains, the, the, the financial statements contain misstatements. Uh, if uh, a publicly held company, you go to the audit committee, so you would go above management and bring it to the attention of the audit committee. If the client still refuses and the audit committee is just ineffective or not supportive, then the auditor has, they can't issue an, an opinion uh, that can, that's saying that the, the statements are, you know, the accounts are fairly stated. So they would issue either, depending on the severity of it, we'll talk about that in a couple of weeks, but depending on the severity of it, they'd issue an adverse opinion or they'd issue a qualified opinion. And if, or they'd withdraw from the engagement, depending on the severity of it. But in any event, the statement has to be corrected. If it turns out that it's an immaterial misstatement, then it's not a big deal.